ValveTime.net. Hi, and welcome to the Valve Time News for June 21st, 2016, where we'll recap all the latest news regarding Valve and the community. After a year and a half out of the spotlight, the unexpected return of Steam Dev Days was randomly revealed these past few weeks. For those not in the know, Steam Dev Days was a multi-day event taking place back in January 2014 which gathered games, software, and hardware developers from around the world to discuss Steam, the PC landscape, and the future of video games in general. The event hosted numerous talks by Valve employees and industry veterans and was seemingly very successful, with YouTube uploads of each talk receiving tens or hundreds of thousands of views as of June 2016. While not earth-shattering numbers, these figures are actually fairly impressive when you consider the very developer-focused nature of most of these videos, with most of them delving deep, industry jargon included, into advanced software or hardware topics such as Linux, virtual reality, game porting, OpenGL, and the Steam controller. After a year away, we assume Steam Dev Days had gone the way of Valve Pipeline and would never be seen or heard from again, but that clearly isn't the case. On the 12th and 13th of October 2016, Valve will once again host the Developer Conference in Seattle, Washington, with this year's topics largely themed around virtual reality, Steam business and marketing, Steam hardware, and user-generated content. The rest of the talks and all of their relevant speakers have yet to be revealed, but attendees can also expect plenty of networking and behind-the-scenes sneak peeks at a lot of upcoming Valve projects. As you may recall, 2014's event showcased the then-named Steam Sight VR headset to a select number of developers over a year before the HTC Vive's official reveal. If you're a developer looking to attend, you can now sign up for the event over on the official announcement page, where two-day tickets are available for $95 each. Don't forget, this is most certainly not the same type of event as E3, Gamescom, or PAX, with no press or fans able to attend. If you're not involved in game development but still want in on the talks, we imagine Valve will steadily release them onto YouTube shortly after the event concludes, so have no fear. As part of Valve's attempt to ever expand their reach into the virtual reality software space, the company recently released Destinations, a new freely available development kit which allows players to quickly and easily create, share, and play 3D environments within virtual reality on both the HTC Vive and Oculus Rift. Utilizing a slightly modified version of the Source 2 SDK used for Dota 2's custom games, VR-ready environments can be constructed out of custom assets and textures, with Valve's own examples largely focusing on areas created using photogrammetry. Created environments can be easily packaged to include the same easy-to-use blink mechanic featured in the lab. It's definitely not a huge release by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a creative step in the right direction for VR, which should hopefully give headset owners a lot more to do and explore should any kind of community spawn around destinations. Check out the software's Steam page now if you're interested in learning more. In other VR game news, Valve's own freely available title The Lab recently received its first major update. Like Valve updates of old, the new content dubbed the Appliance of Science update is entirely free and available as standard to all players of The Lab. It primarily focuses on introducing new features to provide extra connectivity with other players and extra incentives to revisit the game's most interesting minigames, Longbow, Zortex, and Slingshot. Alongside global leaderboards for all three games, Longbow and Zortex have been given infinite modes, which continually spawn more and more ways of increasing difficulty as time passes. For Longbow, the game now continues past the normal 8 rounds and spawns more difficult enemies, while Zortex simply removes the boss encounter and regularly generates new enemies indefinitely until the player dies. Slingshot received more minor changes including an overhauled scoring system for receiving new cores and an increase to the explosive radius of red barrels. Other miscellaneous but still extremely welcome changes such as full voice subtitle and translation support were also added which we recommend you read all about over on the official change log. While we're on the subject of Valve's own hardware, we're quickly approaching the full year mark since the Steam controller first launched last autumn, and although news has been light since 2015, Valve are once again ready to discuss their little controller that could. In their new June update, Steam Community Post, it was revealed that over half a million Steam controllers have been sold as of an undisclosed date, with the rest of the post detailing a number of the device's features, some new and some old. Details of the post include a list of various new third-party game releases that feature native controller support, how to use the controller for non-Steam applications, how to tweak the rumble and button configurations, as well as detailing how the Steam controller can be used alongside Steam VR. It's definitely a lot shorter and less eye-opening than the older December update back in 2015, but it's an interesting little roundup nonetheless. With the International 2016 Dota 2 tournament now only 7 weeks away, Valve have set their sights firmly on the event and its participating players. 
Late on Sunday evening, they announced the six teams which have been directly invited to TI6 following their recent successes at the Manila Major and ESL1 Frankfurt these past two weekends. These teams include OG, Navi, Team Liquid, Newbie, LGD Gaming, and MVP Phoenix. As usual, these invitees will be joined by 10 other teams that will have to fight their way into the main event through a series of qualifiers both regional and open. We won't run through all of the regional and open qualifier teams here in this video as we'd be here all night, so go check them out for yourself on the announcement page over at the open qualifier start on June 21st and the regional qualifiers on the 25th. Ahead of this week's qualifiers in ESL1 Frankfurt this past weekend, Dota 2 was surprisingly updated to the 6.88 balance patch only one day after the conclusion of the Manila Major Tournament. Given the patch's proximity to both Manila and the International 2016, 6.88 is significantly lighter than most main balance updates, focusing on minor buffs and nerfs rather than entire ability or item alterations. Although few, noteworthy changes introduced with the update include reduced damage on Beastmaster's Primal Roar and Death Prophet's Spirit Siphon, increased slows for Lich's Chain Frost and Frost Armor, health and armor changes to the survivability of Troll Warlord's Berserker Rage, and changing Enigma's Black Hole from magic to pure damage while allowing it to penetrate magic immunity. While none of the changes introduced with 6.88 are likely to dramatically change the way Dota 2 or its current metagame are played, it's nice to have something a little extra to tide us over until TI6. Elsewhere, the lack of stretch goals for this year's International 2016 Battle Pass hasn't hurt the event's prize pool growth in any way, with this year's total marginally higher than last year's at the same point in time, or at least it was before one Friday evening a few weeks back. To kick off the weekend, Valve released the Collector's Cache. Cash. Cash. Collector's Cash. A special treasure available to purchase exclusively by those with Battle Passes. The treasure, available for $1.99 or £1.40, features two couriers and a total of 14 item sets, many of which are the first cosmetic outings for their respective heroes. Heroes finally getting their first overdue item sets include Tinker, Shadow Fiend, Winter Wyvern, Zeus, Bane, Undying, and Arc Warden, with a few familiar faces joining in for good measure. Purchasing set numbers of cash treasures also rewards battle points to level up your pass, so there's definitely more than one incentive for opening them. With 25% of the proceeds from every sale going towards the TI6 prize pool, the new cash initially raised the total by nearly a million dollars in under 24 hours after its release, leaving the total significantly higher than the TI5's equivalent at the same time last year. Like almost all the previous operations for Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Operation Wildfire was extended by one month this past week to allow pass owners to finish up the completion of their missions. While no direct changes were made to Operation Wildfire itself, a new Gamma case was introduced bringing 17 new community created weapon finishes and knife skins. The patch also made numerous changes to the Prime Account Beta matchmaking system, upping the entry parameters to also require players to reach Lieutenant Rank 21 before they're eligible to participate. The first of many planned updates for the game's sound system was also implemented, increasing the overall quality of noises for the Mag-7, M249, and the Negev. These changes, alongside numerous other tweaks we won't go into here, are available for you to read more about over on the official changelog. A few weeks back, Valve also announced collectible pins for CSGO, which are the new merchandise pins that provide matching icons able to be displayed on your in-game profile. The real-world pins will be very similar to those handed out at major tournaments throughout the year, and virtual-only versions will also be available via capsules for those not interested in also owning the real thing. While these pins could be picked up at the We Love Fine store, they sold out within less than a week of release, meaning you'll have to wait a while longer for the second series of pins to be released. Happy waiting! Now, it's time for us to address the somewhat murky cloud that has probably been looming over this episode since it started. During our last now polled Roundup episode, we opened by making a big song and dance out of the supposed departure of Valve's Eric Wolpaw, who many of you know as one of the leading writers and brains behind Portal and Portal 2. Details aside, it quickly turned out that we were wrong, and that in this particular instance we failed to conduct the proper background checks and what little information we did have, causing us to pull the video only a few hours after we aired it. Thankfully, Eric is still very much working full-time at Valve, likely contributing to Psychonauts 2 if and when he is required, as indicated by confirmations being thrown around by various Valve employees on Twitter and via emails. We're extremely glad the story we reported on wasn't grabbed or expanded upon by any other major Valve-specific or gaming websites in the short time our news story was live, but we're still profoundly sorry for publishing it in the first place. We know we scared a few of you out there. We're going to try harder in the future to avoid these kinds of mistakes in order to get back to the well-researched, backed-with-evidence news stories you all hopefully expect. 
And on that note, I think it's time to end another few weeks of Valve news. Don't forget to check out our previous content, to follow our social media pages, and to join in with the conversations over at the ValveTime.net community forums. Thanks for watching, and bye for now. Thank you.